Hello, I'm Jeff Mill. I was born in Timaru and I am interested in how this settlement evolved into what we have today. On walking around town and looking through the archives of the South Canterbury Museum, I have discovered many interesting facts that I would like to share with you. I am outside the Information Centre where you can start your tour and this is where our film begins. I would like to show you how it was in the early days and how it is now. Timaru, then and now. In 1851, a fellow called George Rhodes drove 5,000 sheep down here from Christchurch and set up a run at Levels. He built the first European house here on the shore at the end of what is now George Street. Early photos show that this house was right on the beach. There are letters in existence addressed to George Rhodes at Beach Road this is now called Station Street. In order to transfer goods to and from ships anchored off Timaru, Lecrenne's company built a landing service building at the bottom of Strathallan Street, operated by Captain Kane. The boatman for this operation came here from Deal in England. Subsequent to this, another landing service building was established at the bottom of George Street. The boats were winched up the shingle beach and unloaded using derricks. This shot shows the early well at the bottom of George Street. Here is the new railway station. The original station was on our right, where this car is pulling up. As we proceed north, walking along the original platform, we see the grills covering caves dug into the cliff. These are air raid shelters constructed during the Second World War when the threat of a Japanese invasion was a distinct possibility. You may well ask why an Italian flag is flying over a building in Timaru. This building was the Custom House and is now an Italian restaurant. This was in fact Lot 1 DP1, the first deposit plan registering the first section in the first private subdivision in South Canterbury ever. What we're looking at now is the view from the waterfront up Strathallan Street. This used to be the main road down to the seashore and was the main access to the port. Lecrenne's original landing service building is commemorated by a plaque at the base of the loop footbridge. This later photograph of the Government Landing Service building confused me initially because the cliffs seemed to be in the wrong place. They dug away the cliff north of Lecrenne's original building to produce a larger footprint on the beach to accommodate the Government Landing Service building. On the upper level there was room for about 1200 bales of wool. The boats were winched up into the building and loaded through a hatch in the upper floor. Incoming goods were loaded out of the boat into wagons. When the railway line came to Timaru, it went round behind the building and through the cutting to Caroline Bay. The footbridge that we're looking at now is in the same location as the original access way from the terrace to the harbour. Where I'm standing at the moment, I would have been paddling in the surf in front of Lecrenne's landing service building. Here we have the ghost of the government landing service building. The boats lay derelict on the slipway up until the 1950s when the base of the harbour was reclaimed. Some of the boats are still buried beneath the present roadway. Where we're standing now, we're virtually on the slipway of the Government Landing Service building. And looking down the track here, we see the original access way to the North Mole. 
In the Victorian photograph, you can see the early stages of construction. The northern breakwater went out from here, curved around to the right and out to sea, and then came back in and created the harbour entrance opposite the number one breakwater extension. Everybody talks about the tunnel that takes the railway line through into Stafford Street. As far as I can gather, this is it. The track came off the main line on a turntable, went along the side of this warehouse, through a tunnel, under the terrace, and then up to a store which was near Stafford Street. There is an old stone storehouse at the rear of the present Pine Gould Guinness building. Projecting out from the building above are iron beams which were used to raise and lower the goods in and out of the railway trucks. As we travel up the terrace to the South Canterbury Club, we see, just on the left of the car park, the site of the old lighthouse. In the 1980s, the lighthouse was lowered to the ground, transported on a truck and re-erected on a site in Mary Park, where it is now the rear marker for a modern navigational light. Originally the lighthouse replaced the watchtower, visible in the original picture of the harbour shoreline. At the end of the footpath from the terrace is a little footbridge giving access to the harbour. In the early Victorian photograph, you will notice that there was a clay bank on the opposite side, which has now been replaced by the stairway, due to the fact that the original railway line ran through a cutting here. The material from the other side of the cutting has since been removed. The Marine Parade, that is the northern breakwater, extended from here out to sea. The original Marine Parade is where that extension beacon is on the yacht marina. Everything you see in this view here was non-existent in the 1840s. Here in the 1840s there was no harbour, no land on the foreshore. The tide came right up to the base of the cliff we're standing on. There were a lot of shipwrecks along the coast near Timaru. Not all of these were due to the lack of a secure anchorage. Some were due to gear failure, poor seamanship and a lack of local knowledge. The southeasterly swells and storms took their toll on the ships and the landing servicemen, and there was a need for a sheltered harbour. One shipwreck landed up on the slipway of the Government Landing Service building. Some of the crazy proposals for the harbour can be seen in the South Canterbury Museum. There is a current running up the coast at approximately one knot. This carries the shingle up the beach in a northerly direction. There was a lot of discussion and debate about possible shingle build-up and one wacky proposal suggested a swing bridge off the terrace to an offshore harbour to allow the shingle to continue its merry way up the coast. The end result was that an experimental concrete groin was constructed on a lava reef at the end of Strathallen Street. In fact, the shingle did build up behind it and it was destroyed in a storm. Not to be deterred, a concrete breakwater was started made from large precast concrete monoliths which were placed in position using a large steam crane.
two-year contract was let to build the Northern Breakwater, or North Mole as it was called. The rocks, all 65,000 cubic metres of them, came from Fife's Quarry in Glenetti. A tramway was laid to take the rocks down to the beach. The railway trucks were winched out of the quarry up a ramp into Myro Street where the train was assembled. The train went down the left hand side of Waiti Road to the gate of Beverley, now the RSA, crossed over to the other side of the road and across Wales Creek, now Hewling Street, on a wooden viaduct, across the Bay Hill Road, across the main line on a diamond crossing and then south down an inclined ramp to the beach and the harbour. This artist's impression shows what the view from Evans Street looking towards the Bay Hill would have been like in 1878 when the railway was in place. It's contrasted with the modern view of Evans Street and the modern traffic system. <laughs>